covered answer to his seeking came. In a far shimmering background of mind space, a glowing mouth was seen, a luminous shaft, a recluse gate it seemed, musing on joy, a veiled retreat and escape to mystery, away from the unsatisfied surface world, it fled into the bosom of the unknown, a well, a tunnel of the depths of God. It plunged as if a mystic groove of hope through many layers of formless, voiceless self to reach the last profound of the world's heart. And from that heart there surged a wordless call pleading with some still impenetrable mind, voicing some passionate, unseen desire. As if a beckoning finger of secrecy outstretched into a crystal mood of air, pointing at him from some near hidden depth, as if a message from the world's deep soul, an intimation of a lurking joy that flowed out from a cup of brooding bliss, there shimmered, stealing out into the mind, a mute and quivering ecstasy of light, a passion and delicacy of roseate fire. As one drawn to his lost spiritual home feels now the closeness of a waiting love into a passage dim and tremulous that clasped him in from day and night's pursuit. He traveled, led by mysterious sound. We're embarking on one of the most beautiful um, cantos in the whole book out of all the 49. This is uh, one that... Hmm? The word soul is the mother, really, he shows. Of course, Sri Aurobindo and the mother are one. Yes, yes. So, who will read? Martin. Hmm? The covered answer to the seeking came in a far shimmering background of mind space. The glowing mouth was seen, luminous sharp, a recluse gate it seemed, musing on joy, the well retreat, and escape to mystery. Mm -hmm. So he looked above and he saw this fixed firmament and he looked below and he found that fixed firmament. So where does the answer come from? It comes from some other dimension, some deep place. It's covered. It's not an obvious answer. It's something secret that comes. Hmm? Something opens up in a far away, distant 
background of mind space, very, very deep in the innermost recesses of, of mind, shimmering. There's a movement of light. Shimmering is a word for light that's moving. So that mind space, there's some movement in the light there. And there, there seems to be an opening, the mouth, like the mouth of a cave or the mouth of a tunnel. And there's a glow about that opening. Hmm? It seems to lead to a shaft, uh, as when we go into a, a mine. You know, there's a, there's a, a tunnel that has been dug. And that's luminous, it's full of light. That opening seems like a gate, a recluse gate. A recluse is somebody who retires from the world, who goes far away and leaves everything outside to concentrate deep within. So that gate even itself seems to be concentrating, to be musing, to be meditating. And what is it meditating on? It's meditating on joy, on delight. That's what was missing in that um, self of mind. No? It's a veiled retreat. It's a way to escape into mystery. I think that mystery and secrecy are among the most attractive things to us. No? Something that's mysterious. We want to know more about it. It has a power of attraction. So this is an escape, an escape out of that blank, white purity and silence into something mysterious and attractive. It will lead us to the psychic being. This is like the first uh, intimation that there's something there to be discovered. Linda, would you read? Away from the unsatisfied surface world, it should be to the bosom of the unknown, away and to the deep of the depths of the world. So that shaft is leading away from this rumor and movement and call and all this vain seeking and this uh, futile existence. It is um, going away from all that, from the unsatisfied surface world. It's running away, it fled, it's running away into the bosom, into the deep heart of the unknown, what is not yet known. No? It's like a well, a deep well, or a tunnel of the depths of God. Coming into my mind now is a story by our uh, dear Oravillian poet friend, Raymond Tepo, who has translated um, Savitri into French, one of the best translators according to me. And um, he has written a little book called Réel Utopie, which I've helped him translate into English. And one of the little beautiful pieces there, which are expressions of his own inner experiences, there's one called The Talking Tunnel. And it's precisely this tunnel which allows us to go right deep in to find the psychic being. And, uh, yeah, it's nice, worth looking at little story, nice, worth looking at little book. We, you can get it there from Dirk. Uh, Ganga Lakshmi. This to grow of hope. <clears throat> Through many lives 
of formless, voiceless self to reach the last profound of the world's heart. And from that heart, the search of worldless hope, living with some still impenetrable mind, voicing some passionate and simple desire. Thank you. So this well, this tunnel, goes deeper and deeper to plunge means to go deep, to dive, you know, to die. You plunge into the water or you can plunge into meditation, going in deep. So this tunnel is going in deeper and deeper. It's for King Aswapati, it's like a groove, a, a groove, um, a line on which you can run, you know, like a train or a tram runs on track or the needles of the old gramophones used to run in a groove. If you start on that groove, it will lead you somewhere. You know? This is a mystic groove of hope. It gives him hope. And it's plunging, it's going deeper and deeper through many layers of formless, voiceless self. That is the experience of being attracted towards the psychic. It's not just below the surface. Sri Aurobindo says it's not just a quarter inch below, behind the surface. One has to go very, 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 very deep in through many layers. And this particular um, groove is leading not only to the individual psychic being, it's leading to the world soul so it's going to reach the last profound, the last depth. Um, in English, profound is normally an adjective. Here Sri Aurobindo is using it as a noun. We talked about that before, how um, in English we are allowed to do that. And this makes a terrible problem for French translators. I'm just struggling with somebody in England who's trying to translate Savitri into French and we've come to a line about King Aswapati uh, raising his eyes to look for the infinite more above. We can't put this into French somehow. We can't find the way to do it. So. What is that more? Well, everything that's more than what he's already realized. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's an infinite more, there's no limit to it. Mm. It's above. He, he's had some great realizations, but there's so much more. So and if anybody has a suggestion about that, you can share it with me. So here it's profound, no? a depth. the last profound, the deepest point of the heart of the whole world. And there's some message coming out from that heart through that tunnel. There's a communication, it's a talking tunnel. This is a, a pouring out a wordless call. It doesn't come into the form of words like our thoughts do but still it's an appeal or an invitation. It's pleading. It's saying, please, please. It's speaking to this mind, this mind that is still impenetrable, that's still closed, you know? this silent mind. It is voicing, it's wordless, but it's giving a voice to some passionate, intense, unseen desire. There's a longing there for something more. Hmm? Marie. As if beckoning finger of secrecy outstretched into a crystal moon of air pointing at him 
from some near hidden depth. Ask if a message from the world's deep south, an intimation of lurking joy that flows out from cup of brooding bliss. There she now stealing out into the mind, a mute and quivering ecstasy of light, the passion and delicacy of roseate fire. Yes. So this word beckoning, <clears throat> it's something you do with your finger. You invite somebody with your finger. So it's as if a beckoning finger of a secret come. Yeah? And that finger is stretched out into that very, very pure air hmm? that expresses some purity, crystal pure. Hmm? And it's pointing at him, yes, I'm calling you, I'm beckoning to you. Come, come, pointing at him. From some near hidden depth, it's something deep, and yet it's intimate and close. It's hidden, but it's not unreachable. Hmm? It's as if it's a message, this finger of ecstasy, this little ray of ecstasy that's coming. As if it's a message from the deep soul of the world. It's an intimation. An intimation is a message. No? Uh, you may get an intimation from the tax officer that uh, he wants to see you. But this is a, a much nicer kind of intimation. It's a message telling you that you're invited. And it's telling you there's some joy hidden here, lurking. Like the tiger in the jungle, it's hidden. He's there, but we don't see him. That joy is there, hidden away. And that um, intimation, that finger, is flowing out from a cup, a vessel which is full of bliss. Bliss that is brooding. Brooding, of course, means inwardly concentrated, but it has another suggestion as well. It's connected with the hen, the mother hen, who becomes broody, and she sits on her eggs, and she won't eat or go anywhere. She just sits on the eggs until they are ready to hatch. So anything that's brooding is going to give birth to something. It's inwardly indrawn, but something is going to come out, something new. So there's that cup, that container somewhere, full of bliss, bliss that is brooding, preparing, going to give birth to something. So this, this finger shimmers also, this movement of light. Um, it steals out into the mind. This is a verb that means um, it moves without anybody being able to see how it's moving. You know? The dawn light, Shrobindor says, it steals in. You know, that, uh, we can't see how it comes. Only after some time we find, oh, it was dark, now there's some light. Very, very secretly coming in. Into that mind. It's penetrating that mind. This finger of silent, quivering ecstasy of light. It's bringing consciousness and knowledge of a kind. And it has this wonderful quality, intensity and delicacy at the same time. Yeah? Something very, very sweet and uh, precious, delicate about it. 
and it's roseate. This is a beautiful adjective. Right? It means pink, if we want to say it b b uh, brutally. The roseate. In the poem, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Because it's a beautiful way of saying that, uh, that uh, those lovely velvety <coughs> colors of the rose in a pale pink shade. There's a bird called a roseate tern. I, I remember my father had a big book of birds of the world with paintings of them, and my favorite was the roseate tern. It's a beautiful, graceful, quite small bird, uh, white on the front and um, grayish on the back, and under its wings it is pink, beautiful pink. And it's one of those birds that flies from the North Pole to the South Pole on its migrations. The roseate tern. The, that beautiful word expresses exactly that beautiful, um, gentle, uh, shay, shimmering kind of pink. One more sentence. Uh, Eve, would you read? Yes, so it's, <laughs> and that's another image, mm. you know, the, the fire of roses. Mm. And I've experienced that myself, but I, I uh, there's, a, there's a book of a um, wonderful writer of children's storage, jo George Meredith. He wrote 150 years ago, but obviously he knew the mother, we, we find her in his books and uh, in one part of one of the books she's an old lady who is also at the same time young and she's living in the topmost tower of the castle and only the little girl who lives down below can find her and she can't always find her uh, but sometimes when she finds her she has a fire of roses and that uh, fire of course has a wonderful perfume but it also has a purifying power and give, gives knowledge and discernment. Oh. Uh, once coming back from mother on my birthday, cycling up the hill to aspiration in the noonday heat, I had the, on my handlebars the bouquet of red roses that she had given me and they were blazing, <laughs> shimmering with the uh, roseate fire, but it was crimson fire, it was not roseate. <laughs> Fantastic. Just one more sentence. Would you read, Eve? Hmm? Uh, from Rome to this lost spiritual form feels now the closeness of the waking love. Into your passage, we can us that clasp him in from the day and nice posture, posture. It travel led a mysterious sound. Yes. So I think we can understand this, no? As if you're coming home, one who's being attracted, who's coming close to his lost spiritual home, begins to feel that closeness. Oh, there's someone who loves me, is waiting for me. That's what home means, no? So he is, King Aswapati travels into that passage, into that tunnel. It's dim, it's tremulous, it's moving, no? And it's protecting him. It's embracing him, clasping him in and protecting him so that this world of dualities, of day and night, of opposites, can't follow him into that, uh, that tunnel. And he's being led the way that he must go. He's following a sound. And that very, very special sound uh, we'll read about next week. Mm. A covered answer to his seeking came.
in a far shimmering background of mind space, a glowing mouth was seen, a luminous shaft, a recluse gate it seemed, musing on joy, a veiled retreat and escape to mystery. Away from the unsatisfied surface world, it fled into the bosom of the unknown, a well, a tunnel of the depths of God. It plunged as if a mystic groove of hope through many layers of formless, voiceless self to reach the last profound of the world's heart. And from that heart there surged a wordless call pleading with some still impenetrable mind, voicing some passionate, unseen desire. As if a beckoning finger of secrecy outstretched into a crystal mood of air, pointing at him from some near hidden depth, as if a message from the world's deep soul, an intimation of a lurking joy that flowed out from a cup of brooding bliss. There shimmered Stealing out into the mind, a mute and quivering ecstasy of light, a passion and delicacy of roseate fire. As one drawn to his lost spiritual home feels now the closeness of a waiting love into a passage dim and tremulous that clasped him in from day and night's pursuit, he travelled led by a mysterious sound. 